Hello, Adult Sunday School Leader. Hey, if you're like me, you don't remember many of the dreams you have, but the ones you do remember are crazy. When my wife and I were visiting our daughter and her family back in South Carolina last week, I had one of those dreams that you wake up from and you have this whole host of emotions. Here's what happened. I, I was getting ready to teach my Sunday School class. This is in my dream. But it, I was in a different church and I was in a fellowship hall for some reason. And and I, I don't know why, but other classes kept coming in to sit in in my class. And I kept looking for my teaching notes, and I couldn't find them. And, and I knew I couldn't teach without them. And then I had to borrow somebody's Bible because I left mine in my office someplace. And then, once I had the Bible, I opened up and I couldn't read the print. It was, I just couldn't focus on it. So I did what any good teacher would do in the situation, hoping to buy a little time until I could somehow remember what I was supposed to be teaching. I asked an opening question. Who can tell us what we're studying today? And there was no response. After a few seconds of that awkward silence, somebody in the class said, well, why don't you tell us? I felt so unprepared. I, I didn't have my teaching notes, didn't have my Bible. I couldn't even remember the lesson topic. By the way, if any of you have the gift that Daniel or Joseph had about dream interpretation, please let me know, or maybe I don't want to know what that meant. Anyway, whether we realize it or not, we are constantly in a spiritual battle, and without an active prayer life, we're fighting a spiritual war uh, unprepared. That's when we find ourselves spiritually floundering, as I did in my dream, because of our unpreparedness. Well, this week we're in the last lesson in that series on Daniel. It's called Staying True in a World Far from God. The sixth lesson is called Prepare for Battle. The passage is uh, some verses out of Daniel chapter 10. And the point of the lesson is God strengthens us as we pray and engage in spiritual battle. Well, Daniel chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, that's our first set of verses that we're going to look at this week. Now, in last week's lesson, in Daniel 9, it was the first year of King Darius's reign. And that was the historical setting for that lesson. Well, this week, it's the third year in the reign of Cyrus. Now, we sure have gone through a lot of kings and rulers in these last uh, six weeks of study. And I easily, I'll just admit, I easily get confused with the rulers of different kingdoms and who they are and the timeline of all that. So hopefully this brief overview will help us both. So in 539 BC, that's when Belshazzar, uh, that was the Babylonian king, held that feast where the handwriting on the wall appeared. We had that a few lessons back. And uh, as we read in Daniel chapter 5, verses 30 through 31, it says, That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Okay, Now, 11 years before the fall of Babylon, this had been in 550 B.C., the Medes had fallen to the Persians. Now, at the time of Daniel chapter 5, back in 539 B.C., it was actually the, the, the Persian Empire under Cyrus that conquered Babylon. So Darius the Mede was appointed as a vassal king by Cyrus for just a couple of years before Cyrus directly took over as ruler. Now back in Daniel 6, 28, right after the, the lion's den story, it says this, So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. This shows us that Darius and Cyrus reigned concurrently. Now, an interesting side note here is that Darius was the nephew of Cyrus. Well, uh, so if 539 BC is the beginning of the reign of Darius, it also marks the beginning of the reign of Cyrus over the former Babylonian Empire. So if this is the third year of the reign of Cyrus, then this Daniel chapter 10 occurs about the year 536 BC. Well, in 538 B.C., a couple of years before, Cyrus issued a decree that allowed the Israelites to return to Judah. We can read about that all in the book of, of the book of Ezra. Well, at this point in time, Daniel is in his 80s, maybe even his 90s. Now, back to the biblical text. The, the first verse is written in the third person. 
He also identifies himself as Belteshazzar. That's the Babylonian name given to him decades before. These two things indicate that Daniel, he, he was writing this as, as an official document. However, from verse 2 through the end of the book, Daniel writes in the first person. Well, during the third year of King Cyrus's reign, so this was around 536 B.C., Daniel had a revelation. He had a vision. And this wasn't a pleasant vision either. In, in fact, Daniel wrote that he mourned for three weeks following this, following this revelation. That's a long time to mourn. He didn't fast as we've seen him do in previous lessons, but he did restrict his diet. He consumed no choice foods, no meat, consumed no wine. He seems that he just ate enough to, to keep himself alive. And you probably know how this is if you've been stressed or you experience grief or some for some reason the appetite seems to wane, seems to, to kind of go away. I know when my wife was in the hospital for 17 days almost four years ago, I lost 12 pounds during that uh, 17 days. For one thing, I had to cook for myself and you know that's not all that appetizing, but also I really just wasn't that hungry. Well then verse 3 tells us that Daniel uh, he didn't apply any lotions during those three weeks. What's that about? Well, putting oil and lotions on one's skin, of course, helped nourish the skin in that very hot and dry climate of that area. It was also a sign of mourning not to use lotions. We see that um, after the death of David and Bathsheba's son in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 20, when Daniel was uh, through with mourning. It says he got up, changed his clothes, and applied lotions. So in verses 4 through 9, Daniel had a vision on the banks of the Tigris River. It was, it was of a man, or at least a being that with, had the appearance of a man. He had this booming voice, a, a face like lightning, eyes like torches, and, and the feet of bronze. This was definitely some kind of heavenly being. We know there are only two angels mentioned in the, by name in the Bible, Gabriel and Michael. Now Michael's mentioned later in the chapter, in verses 13 and 21, so I, this is not him. Now some think this may be the angel Gabriel, since he's mentioned back in 8:16 and 9:21. Now Gabriel is also known. He's you know he's known for making another announcement to someone who is treasured by God. And that would of course be Mary out of Luke 2. But if Daniel previously had had an encounter with Gabriel, surely he would have recognized the angel and properly identified him here. So for now we're just going to identify him as an angel. Now, someone in class may mention that in Revelation 2.18, the description of Jesus includes terms like feet of bronze and eyes like blazing fire. Could this be the pre-incarnate Jesus? I don't believe it is, and I'll give a couple of reasons for that here in a bit. Well, our next set of verses is 10 through 13 of chapter 10. Daniel was literally touched by an angel, and this made him tremble. Uh, on his hands and knees. And the angel reassured Daniel that he was highly esteemed. He was treasured and to stand up. Now here's the first reason I don't believe this is a, the pre-incarnate Jesus. Daniel's posture was one not only of fear, but of worship. In Revelation 22 verses 8 and 9, we see that angels do not accept worship. They allow God to be worshiped only. So Daniel stood, uh, but he was still trembling. And, you know, I really can't blame him. I would be, too. The angel told Daniel those four words in English that occur so much throughout the Bible. Do not be afraid. And, of course, it's more succinctly stated in the King James Version. Fear not. Now, remember, it was three weeks before this encounter with the angel that Daniel had, a, had that revelation. But the understanding of the revelation didn't come until 21 days later. During that time, Daniel mourned. And even though the text doesn't specifically state this, just based on what we've already learned about him, I believe Daniel spent that time in earnest prayer for an answer as to what that revelation meant. Now, if we stop the lesson right here, there'd be so much that we could take away from the text. So let's just mention a couple of those takeaways. First, there could be a reason why your prayers and my prayers aren't answered immediately. In this week's lesson, we see that it's here because the angel who was dispatched to interpret the revelation was being resisted. The angel told Daniel that he had been in, that he had been delayed for 21 days. Remember, that's the same amount of time that Daniel had been waiting for an answer. He was in mourning. And why was the angel delayed? 
that brings us to the second reason, the second point that, that we can glean from this text, because there was, it was and is a spiritual battle going on in the unseen realms that we really have no idea about. We, know, we learn a little bit about this spiritual warfare as the angel continues talking to Daniel. The angel was resisted by the prince of Persia. Now, I believe we can safely assume that this is another angelic being, actually a, a fallen angelic being, with authority over the kingdom of Persia. You may be thinking, no, no wait a minute, that's, that sounds a little far-fetched. What are you talking about? Well, and true, it, it probably does sound a little far-fetched, but there's a lot about the spiritual world that we don't know and we don't understand. Do angels have authority or watch over nations? What's that about? Well, here's what Paul says in Ephesians 6.12. You may know this verse. For, we, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but what? Against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Also consider Ephesians 3.10. It says this. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. So it sounds like there's some rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, in the unseen world, that we really don't know that much about. Let's also look at the last two verses in this book, which are really not in our lesson text for the week. Down in verses 20 and 21, it says this. So he said, Do you know why I have come to you? This is the angel talking to Daniel. Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I do, the prince of Greece will come. But first, I will tell you what's written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, your prince. Well, in verses 13 and here in 21, Michael, another angel, is referred to as a prince. The angel speaking to Daniel again refers to the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece. So it appears that, that there are angelic forces called princes battling around or battling against each other. In Numbers 22, we see the story of Balaam and his donkey. You know, Balaam's eyes were open to the spiritual side of things and he saw an angel right there blocking the road. And in 2 Kings 6, verses 17 through 20, we can read about how the eyes of Elisha's servants were opened, and he was able to see the hills filled with horses and chariots of fire, and an angel army there ready to protect Elisha and his servant. All this to say that there's a spiritual war happening all around us that we aren't even aware of. Well, our, our last set of verses is down 16 through 19 of this same chapter. And in this story, we see the angel physically touching Daniel on several occasions. We read that back in, in verse 10, where the angel touched Daniel and caused him to tremble. Now the angel touched Daniel's lips. This enabled Daniel, who, according to verse 15, was speechless, as, of course, I would be too. And, and you know, this reminds me of Isaiah 6, where the seraph touched Isaiah's lips with, with that hot coal. Well, Daniel then spoke and admitted that he was completely zapped of energy and of breath. And again, the angel touched Daniel and gave him strength. And again, told him not to be afraid and reassured him that, that he was highly esteemed, that he was treasured by God. And as the angel touched Daniel, he told him twice to be strong. And this further strengthened Daniel to, uh, to where he was ready to hear what the angel had come to tell him. Now, let's not get hung up on Daniel calling the angel my lord, okay? As you're probably aware, this is just a title of respect. It's like saying sir in English. And notice it's, it's smaller, L-O-R-D. Right? It's not the all caps uh, L-O-R-D. It's not Yahweh here. It's just that title lord. Uh, it's like our Spanish-speaking friends using senor for either lord or mister. So, uh, several years ago, I read uh, a book called This Present Darkness by Frank Peretti, and I was captivated by the vivid way the author painted the, the, a picture of what goes on in the spiritual world. And while it's a novel, and it's probably not 100% factual as to what goes on, it does give a, a glimpse into the unseen world of spiritual warfare. 
So just as an angel came to minister to Daniel in our story this week, and as angels ministered to Jesus after Satan's temptations that we see back in Matthew chapter 4, I believe angels minister to us even today. And, you know, that's one side of spiritual warfare. But remember, it was because of Daniel's prayer that the angel came to Daniel in the first place. In fact, verse 12 says, Your words were heard, and I came in response to them. A good indicator that uh, of your spiritual strength is your prayer life. So also remember that Ephesians 6, 13 through 17 mentions the armor of God that allows us to stand against the devil's schemes, to stand against the spiritual warfare that's going on in our lives. So there's a spiritual battle going on around us. Okay, There's angels that are battling, and then there's a spiritual battle in our own lives as well. So are you being strengthened through your prayer life, or are you a casualty of war? Because even though you're on the winning side, you aren't well prepared. So that's something to consider. That's something to ask the class. Well, next week we start a, a new, brand new unit. It's a study called Confident in the Face of Hard Questions. It, it's going to be a very practical study because it addresses many questions that m several people outside the church, and maybe even some in your class as well, many Christians, they ponder, they think about these things. So I look forward to that, to that series. Thank you guys very much for watching. I appreciate you. Don't forget, pray for and with your class this week.